So on the show today, on this episode of Guitar Autopsy, we have none other than Mark Tremonti. Um, if any of you guitar players out there, out there aren't familiar with Mark, um, which I don't know who wouldn't be familiar with Mark, um, he's played in Creed, Ultra Bridge, and his own solo band, Tremonti. Um, and, uh, well, let's bring him on. What up? How's it going, man? How you doing? Good, man. How are you? Good. Nice. Whoa. Yeah. Holy guacamole, bro. I got piles of amps that, that need to be played. Holy shit. That is what I call a studio. Oh, check this out. Check this yeah. out. So we got this sound baffling stuff going on here. Okay. And you open up the secret room of doom. Oh, shit. And then you go check back. Check it out. Wow. To amp, to amp oh, my God. Here. I'm telling you, bro. That's yeah. that's amazing, dude. Yeah, that's, that's where it happens in here. Okay, so I can only imagine that outside of this place, you must have another place that you store all the rest of your gear. We have touring gear back at the uh, in a in a warehouse across right. town. Oh yeah. And so do you have guitars at home that never go out on the road? I do. And, yeah, so, and you have like specifically touring gear. Well, you know, we like to have you know us guitar players like to have a Strat and a Tele and a. You know, a mixture of guitars. PR, you know, I like to stay true to my PRS endorsement on stage, right. so I, I don't play strats on stage. So that right. if I have a strat, it's going to stay at home. Right. Oh, man, you know, I'm so rude. Uh, Zach, this is Mark. Mark, this is Zach. Zach's my co-host. Zach, what's up, man? Um, How's it going, man? Yeah, yeah Zach's, Zach owns his own music school in Omaha. Wow. So that's where he's, he's oh. um, coming from today. So you, so you guys both you guys both teach? Yeah. Well, yeah, I need some, I need music some. school, and, and I, I teach exclusively from out of my home studio now. Um, I was I was teaching out of a music school, and it just it's more convenient here. I don't have to leave, and you know that's that's pretty cool, right? Well, I need some new licks, Rusty. Sure, man. I got you on that department always. There you go. Yeah. What what have you been what have you been working on? Well, I just finished. Um, well, I, I guess I shouldn't say that I did this, but I just finished writing a ton of solos for my new solo record. Okay. Is this going to be your fifth solo album? Fifth solo record, yeah. Okay. Cool, um, man. So I just finished writing my last solo for that. Um, yeah, I always save to the end the songs and the wacky tunings because mm -hmm. you can't just blaze away on a pentatonic riff. You got to completely yeah. start over. Right. Um, so I just finished, I don't know, about 10 or 11 solos, and that kind of takes that takes everything I've learned for the past two years out of me. So hopefully right. I enough to i don't like each record to have the same licks on them so of course not man right you know so so this new album do you have a release date not yet we're thinking maybe maybe um in the october <clears throat> okay fall yeah. something like that that's cool man so with each new record you, you are you're always pushing yourself to yeah. you know what i mean so like you said you used all the stuff you've been working on over the last two years on yeah. your solos so what kind of stuff should we expect you know, my main thing that I was excited about was uh, picking patterns of five. Um, okay. You know, I, I think I went down the rabbit hole like everybody else has in our world of, of hearing Eric Johnson and trying to economy pick five patterns. Mm -hmm. And I get it. I understand it and I can play it, but I'm a very, I'm a very um, aggressive picker to my own detriment. I don't think, I think I pick too hard and it, and it sometimes it hurts my, um, my string crossing techniques, especially with economy picking. So I'll, I'll yeah. play it. And if I'm sitting down at home and I'm playing to a metronome or a backing track, I can do it. But if I'm, if I'm on stage and I'm all amped up, I know yeah. it's just going to be a, a yeah. mess. So, so I, you do try to economy pick those things. I, you know, well, honestly, I didn't, yeah. I didn't know that, uh, Eric economy picked. He economy picks like, uh, he'll go, you know, down, up, down, up, down, down. No, this is a pentatonic style lick, right? Yeah, yeah. So if right. he's descending down, right. one, two, three, scale, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, down, up, down, up, down, down, up, down. You know, he'll just when he has to do that that uh, that one string change, he'll do that simple one little economy pick. I see. Uh, that's cool. I, I see. I always economy pick that. I mean, alternate pick that. Like I didn't know. Maybe so I messed with that for a few years, and I yeah. felt like you know I'm okay at it, but I'm not. I'm just not getting to where I need to be with it to to. Uh, I always make this reference, like say you're playing in front of the most intimidating crowd you've ever seen. You know, you're playing right. in front of all your heroes. Can you play that lick in front of them? Uh, right. and I, I couldn't say yes to that. Yeah, that's a yeah. good way to think about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'll have to use that one. So yeah. <laughs> it might well, save my ass sometimes. Since my answer is no, 
I want to pick these five patterns, but I just found a different way of picking them. Kind of like the, um, the old school way Petrucci would go up a pentatonic scale with two notes on one string and three on the next. I see. Picking those, um, where if you're, I love like if you take a pattern like that and you pick through the pattern, then you repeat the pattern where you're focusing either on the first strike or the last strike, that upstroke or that downstroke alternating each time. So you're mm -hmm. hitting that down real hard and that up real hard and that down real right. hard on those patterns of five. Yeah. Um, and then focusing on making the ending note, that, that exaggerated note. Right. And I spent a lot of time on that and finally got those patterns feeling like, you know, yeah, I can finally feel like I can play these and it fits my style. I can be aggressive with it. Yeah. Um, I don't have the economy pick. I just have to yeah. be conscious of those strong upstrokes or downstroke, alternating upstrokes and downstrokes right. on those beginnings of those patterns of five. So that's probably my biggest um, thing I've worked the hardest on between these last couple records. That's pretty cool, man. That's pretty cool. So, and you do every note picked on that stuff. Every single note picked, yeah. Gotcha. That's awesome, yeah. man. Um, so, what else you got in store? Uh, so I've got that. I've um, I'm trying to work on this project. It's kind of a top secret, fun project. It's going to be a, for charity. It's, okay. uh, it's and I'm going to challenge other people to do the same thing. But I'm going to try to tackle something that nobody would ever expect me to do. Okay. Um, and then challenge other people to do it in the name of charity. Like, like okay. hey, you got Rusty Cooley, who everybody thinks of as this, uh, you know, a hard rock, heavy metal, badass, shredding guitar player who also right. comes out with his love for Cindy Lauper. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay. And, yeah. You know, it does a cover of Cindy Lauper's favorite tunes. You know, something along the lines of that. I'm going to come up with something. Something un completely unexpected. Something way out of left field. I'm going to do it for charity. I'm going to try and do it with some of the original musicians from where this came from. Okay. And I'm uh, very excited about it because I'm a massive fan of this uh, person right. that I'm trying to uh, emulate. That's that's exciting, man. Yeah, I'd yeah. love to be involved in something like that. You know, yeah. I think everybody should always take them, put themselves into a you know an uncomfortable position as a yeah. musician because that's what makes you grow. And I'm not going to have a stick to what's, yeah. huh? I'm not going to have a guitar in my hand either. Oh, you're playing a different instrument? I'm Are you singing? singing? I can't say. I'm just singing. Okay, all right. That's yeah. cool, man. But well, even though are going to be the other musicians are going to be incredible that that hopefully that I organized for this. So. All right. Well, very cool, man. Well, I'm I'm stoked, man. I can't wait to check it out. When are you guys going back on the road with all this COVID stuff? How's that affected you? There's been rumors um, uh, there's been rumors about tours being put together for the summer and the fall. Uh, my first real offer was in January to do the ship rocked cruise, which that's next year. That's yeah. 2022. Right. Um, I absolutely, yeah, I love doing that tour. So I already said, uh, absolutely. We'd be on it. Okay. You know, it's, it's one that? Thing. Sorry, man. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a great band. Right. Yeah, it's um, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think it's one thing going back out and playing outdoor shows or whatnot, but this is on a cruise ship Probably the last place you want to be during a pandemic, but right next year I'll, I'll have 19 vaccines by then. I'm sure. Cause I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to get vaccine shots to, um, to be able to travel out of the country. I'm sure. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. That's probably pretty heavy on that stuff, you know? Um, yeah. so what have you been doing to keep yourself busy? I guess writing, finishing your, your new solo album, man, a lot. I've, uh, I moved, I moved okay. into my new house or my old house. Um, so I had a entire house. So, um, so you broke up there for a second. So you, you moved into a new house. I moved into my old house that I refurbished, oh, but I, okay. but I had to fix up the house I was in for the last few years. So I had to paint it. Okay. So with all this downtime, I just got the ladder out and painted the exterior of the house and just, no shit. Fixed as much as I could on so my own. this is what Mark Tremonti does when he's not playing guitar. That's he's outside right. painting his house. That's right. right. You know what? Today, actually I'm painting, uh, I have this old piece of furniture that was, didn't match the new, the, you know, the, the look of the house. So I'm refurbishing this old, piece of painting this piece of furniture right now. So I, I just, uh, I like to stay busy. Yeah, absolutely, man. So what else do you do for fun? That's not music related. I'm a pinball guy. I love yeah. pinball. Um, cool. I like to play some ping pong, some pinball, some, um, you know, hanging out with kids, playing, playing sure. soccer with the kids or basketball with the kids. Yeah. Um, your boys got to no. be getting up there. You got uh, your Austin. He's like teenager now, right? Austin is turning 16 in May. 
Wow, you'd start in driver's ed? He's uh, he's hasn't started yet, but he drives with us. You know, we okay. we've taught him how to drive, and uh, right. he was really nervous at first. Now he asks us if he can if he can drive, so it's it's That's good. Cool, uh, how you feel about that? Well, he he tells me he wants a Tesla. I'm like, you're out of your mind. Oh, <laughs> you're out of your mind. Yeah, I want a Tesla too. Yeah. <laughs> right. well, oh, when nice. I told him when I when I drove when I was 16 years old, I had to get in, in from the passenger side into my car. My, right. I, you had to roll down the window to get into the door in the, in the driver's seat. Right. Yeah. yeah. We didn't have we didn't have nice cars back then. So yeah, we, man. We're not going to have a nice car either. Yeah. When I started driving, it was whatever my dad built. You know, he would yeah. get stuff because he was he did all kinds of mechanic work and stuff. And whatever my car was, it was something that he got and refurbished and put back together. You know, I'm, yeah. I had a '68 Mustang one time that we bought, or that he bought, I should say, and. Um, when we got it, it was just like a rust bucket. I mean, yeah. you know, I was out there in the driveway with the airplane paint stripper, getting all the paint off it. He had to redo the floorboards. They were all rusted out. I mean, yeah, so how we, badass is that? It's, oh, dude, it was awesome. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, so, I mean, I, was, I wasn't enjoying it at the time because I wanted to be inside playing guitar. I mean, I was yeah. outside getting my hands dirty and didn't really think that was very fun at the time. Okay. But but looking back, it's, it's I, I really appreciate it now. You know, yeah. sometimes you have to grow up a little bit to appreciate those things that, yeah. you know, I mean a lot so yeah so that was that was fun so so austin's gonna get a uh an old hoopty huh <laughs> i don't know i mean i'm sure his mother's gonna fight me yeah. all day long on getting him the safest car you can get you know right. maybe, maybe a cherokee or something like that yeah no. yeah my, of, my mom was the same way tons of dad, my, yeah there you go um my mom was always the same way i remember my dad brought home some little bitty car i mean i don't even know what it was it was one of those really tiny ones kind of like a mazda miata but this was way before then but it was about yeah. that size my mom's like he's not driving that car no i wouldn't put my kids in that for sure yeah tiny little death trap but oh. yeah so um dude you want to you got your guitar handy uh do i have a guitar handy let me see where's my it's in the other room let me, let me go grab it give me a Here second you. So, dude, with all this gear that you got, how do you decide what to play through every day? You know, I, I've got the uh, MT-100 here. Right. Me uh, too. I've got one right back there. You can see it. One. MT-100? Oh, no, no, no. It's the MT-15. MT-15. Sorry. Yeah. No, the MT-15, I've got... Uh, that was my go-to amp. Uh, the 15? Oh, yeah. Now, oh. We're dialing, now I'm dialing in the MT-100. So, this is a 100-watt version. This is, the, this is the big brother to the MT-15. Dude, that's awesome. Is that out now? It is not. We're, just, we're trying to get it dialed in for uh, for NAM this year. Okay. Um, so are you going to go to NAM? Well, Shiprock is during NAM. Oh, okay. So that's the Shiprock's already confirmed. It's going to happen. Uh, well, they hope so. You know, nobody, okay. really, nobody really knows. Right. So if it doesn't, would you go to NAM then? I would, yeah, I'd definitely okay, go cool. because we're promoting this amp, and yeah. I think it's going to be the baddest ass amp. I can't wait to hear it, dude. It's it's sick. Um, so one of the things with the amp is it's got one of the best clean channels. Oh wow! It's actually tune up first. Sounds good, man. Already the clean channel is just insanely good it's got a ton of headroom a lot of a lot of high end i love uh Fender twins mm -hmm. and this one's just uh kind of like a very big sounding f boutique fender twinny kind of just incredible yeah. clean tone i mean the t15's got great clean tone oh yeah, I mean, yeah. it's got really good tone oh, yeah. man. that's one of the things i knew was gonna be on that amp for sure because i know how you are with your clean tones man I love amps, man. I love my clean channels. Um, so this amp's gonna have, you can see it's, uh, show you. Okay, cool. So. All right. Uh, can you see that? Here we go. I can, yes. No, this is, this is just a prototype of this right now. But, right. Um, I always run a G Lab delay through, that's yeah. my favorite delay. Dude, I bought one based on your recommendation. I oh, love that. I, like it. I love it, man. It's great. Yeah. So I bought, uh, I have one on pretty much half of the amps I have in here because I love them so much. Awesome. Um, so this has, this amp is going to have three channels. Okay. Um, it's got my clean channel here. 
and this is you know you got the clean and dirty just like the mt15 it's pretty much sounds like a bigger bitter bigger better version of the mt15 okay but the third channel kind of captures or will capture kind of that dumble sound you know the uh that boutique um you know half dirty bluesy kind of thing right that's what i was figuring yeah um because there's not there's not really a high gain amp on the market that that's doing that right that's for sure you know it's hard to it's hard to capture those you know both of those worlds i imagine you know it can't be an easy task well it's even it's even hard to capture to find an amplifier that has a nice big brutal rhythmic rhythm tone with that that also has a singing lead to it and then you switch over to the clean and it's just pure great sounding clean there's a lot of i won't name names but there's a lot of great heavy metal amps high gain amps that the clean tone you would never even think twice about right using. Yeah. they just kind of throw them into the amp because they know right people aren't really going for that clean tone they're going for the heavy big brutal tone right so they just put it on there yeah <laughs> there's there's, yeah, there's a, a bunch of them there's a yeah. ton of them you know yeah um That's for sure but this you know i really wanted to focus on this clean tone and um and like I said, that boutique third channel, but that's the only channel now that's not dialed in yet. Because What's the that. third channel? Yeah, the Dumbo style channel. Right. It sounds yeah. great. I can dial it in and make it sound good, but it's uh, yeah. right now it's kind of, uh, if you turn the knob a little too high, it's set for stun, it'll just tear your head off and it's got yeah. too much gain. I want to dial it way back. Is this <laughs> Is this one of those heads that you can't play quiet? No, you can play it. No, quiet. So you can actually turn it down and it'll still get a good sound. I mean, because a lot oh, of um, like a lot of dirty channel right now. <laughs> I can turn it down to uh, bedroom level. Yeah, you got quiet is now. Yeah. That's crazy because I mean, and I can tell how much quieter it is because I can hear your pick attack now over the amp. Yeah. You know, before I couldn't hear that. And it's, and the tone didn't sound like it changed at all. No, no, it's definitely bedroom level and it's not a noisy. I told him, um, I want this amp to be able to be a bedroom level amp, but a hundred watt amp that you can have at this level. And I want you to isolate all the little, I don't know the, how to set up the guts right. of the amp, but I want you to isolate any kind of capacitor or whatever it is that makes noise when it's too close to something else right so i can turn this thing way way down without it humming so yeah. if you can hear you can hear my audio that's that's pretty quiet for 100 watt amps yeah i don't really hear it so so that's pretty good man yeah for sure now do you do you are you dialing this in so you don't have to use any kind of overdrive pedal or anything like that in front of it there's nothing in front of it i just have the delay in the in the loop i can't stand playing a dry amplifier dry yeah dry notes. I have a yeah. lot of people that come over and they're like, just take take all the effects off, play it dry. I want to hear what the amp really sounds like. Well, you know what it sounds like? It just has a little delay. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> it still sounds the same thing. Yeah. yeah. I can't yeah. stand dry amplifiers. So. Yeah, I hear well, you, man. Especially yeah. clean. Yeah. Man. And right clean now I have it to be played dry. Through, I have it going through my favorite cabinet of all time. Um, yeah. It's a custom. Sorry, it's a custom cab. It came with. Um, it's a 412 custom cab that came okay. with the 72 coupe amp that came back, out back in uh, maybe the late 90s, early. I, I can't remember, but um, those guys were nice enough to send me a half stack. And uh, I love the head, too. It's good. But the mm-hmm. cabinet is my favorite cabinet of any cabinet I've ever owned. Really? I, what I, What I, is it that you, what's, what's, what kind of speakers are in it? It's just vintage thirties, but they're English made vintage thirties. Okay. You know, now so what's think, the, what's the tonal difference? Where, where else, or can you get vintage thirties? Um, well, they're made they in import China, versions. Like would they make import? Yeah. Those? Now, now they're made in China and okay. they still sound great, but the, um, the English ones, I guess there would be the original badass vintage thirties. Yeah, can you, can, can people buy those still? You could probably get on on reverb or ebay and hunt them down but i don't i don't know if you can still i don't know if they're still making them in england right sure. so it wouldn't be like a brand new thing you could find no i think no kidding. Them so when you got that amp those were those those speakers were obviously new though right yeah. Oh, yeah. okay that's pretty cool man and it's i don't know it must just be the wet the amount of air they have in the cabinet the, the woods mm-hmm. they use the 
you know, I, I was so surprised how much of a difference the cloth covering in front of your speakers makes. I don't know the grill. I remember what? going up to um, New York and I was buying a train wreck amplifier mm -hmm. and I was trying to pick my favorite one out. And, uh, and my buddy was like, you know what, before you do that, let's take a few cabinets here and make sure you're, you like the tone of the amp because a lot of the tone comes from, you know, so he put up three cabinets. They're all, um, 1960 Marshall cabs with different, mm -hmm. um, tweeds, you know, different vinyl or tweed or basket weave on them. Right. And, uh, makes a massive massive difference that you know you know it's obvious because that's where the speaker's coming through but um, right so i guess i what like if, this this weave on this thing this uh vinyl weave if you had to d describe it could you say what the difference was in the metal grill compared to a cloth or whatever um, this one just seems rich and warm mm -hmm. you know it's not like not what about when you're trying out the three uh, oh. amps we're just talking about on those different cabs like the um like when you have the basket weave mm -hmm. maybe it was brighter okay. maybe when you had th th this kind of um uh, vinyl or whatever you call it, this this mm -hmm. the, the, whatever I know, I know, I know, yeah. now, it has right. a little bit more of a warm compressed sound to it because the speakers are hitting hitting that right. you know yeah that makes uh, sense yeah, I, I never really thought about the difference in the in the grill, what type of grill it had on it, it to make a difference. But now that I think about it, it does. I mean, like that cabinet you have behind you, that is, is that uh, the, the right here? One? Yeah, yeah, that's a diamond cab. It's I got think the I had one years ago. It. it probably sounds way different than that boogie cab next to it. it. It does. The primary difference between the diamond and the boogies is that the diamond is completely mid range driven, whereas yeah. the boogies don't seem to have half the mid-range the diamond cabinet does so yeah. it's, it's 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 like night and day the difference in those two cabinets man yeah. um i find the oversized rectos to be pretty dark um compared to and i think that has something to do with it too the mid-range and size of the cabinets but yeah but i'm not an expert in that department i just know it it when i hear it the, the diamond has a lot more mid-range than yeah. the boogies do and that boogie's a slant cap too i, I like yeah. um I like straights. Um, yeah, straights are definitely my favorite sounding. Uh, I've, I've probably gotten rid of a lot of heads because I didn't think they sounded good because I was playing through a slant cab and didn't realize. Right. How much you know what? I and I, I would. I only buy straight cabinets too, but I inherited those from one of my students. Yeah. I teach this doctor. Yeah. For years at his house, and he he called me up earlier this year, and he goes, "Dude, uh, I want you to come down. Uh, I got some stuff for you." I was like, all right, cool. And uh, I went down and met him and we went to his storage unit and he gave me all of this gear. He goes, I'm 70 years old this year. He goes, I got all this stuff. I'm not going to use it anymore. He goes, I want you to have it. And he goes, if there's anything here you don't want, take it, sell it, buy something you do want. I was like, holy cow. I mean, I came home with two truckloads of equipment. Man, and that was, it was two, two of these cabinets. It was a, a VH4 uh, diesel and uh, just all kinds of pedals and, and crazy stuff, man. I was like blown away. But I mean, you know. VH4 is awesome. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the story behind that. I got these two, you can't see these here, but I got two, um, uh, four, not two, uh, two twelve Rivera cabinets. Uh, and they're the rare, they're the blonde ones that you can take yeah. the back off. So you can use as an open cabinet or a closed back yeah. cabinet. So they're pretty cool. Um, yeah, like I, haven't, I haven't had a, I had a Rivera one of the second amp I ever bought, man, but that was, yeah, well, he, when he got these Rivera cabinets, it, he had a knucklehead uh -huh. amp, um, amp um, yeah. and he already sold the knucklehead. So I got the so I got those two cabinets as well as those two boogie cabinets. Yeah. So yeah. it was like it was a it was a very cool thing to happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's so yeah, man. So I'll have to you know now that I got because the grill on this is not like the grill on those two. So this is more of a weave on this Rivera. So I'll have to put them all three out and do the test, man. Yeah. You know, and, and I've still never taken the backs off these Rivera cabinets to see what that sounds like either. Um, I've never really thought about using an open back cabinet, you know, but he said that sounds great yeah. with the back off of them. Well, I think especially for uh, for clean stuff. Yeah, that's where, you, where it shines back. the most. I've used maybe ported cabinets for, for dirty stuff, but never like an open back. Right. Like maybe years ago, but no, nothing ever stuck. Right. You know, what, yeah. you know what amp I got in here that's really blown me away recently is... Uh, I think you would love is is this one right here the uh oh yeah dude 
And that amp is sick. I have yet to get to play on one of those, but I've, I've talked with him a couple of times. Oh, man, I would love to try one of those. Dude. You would. If I yeah. know you, you would yeah. love that amplifier. Yeah. Which one is it? Is that the Omega? That's the Omega Granifier. Right. Yeah. yeah, I've got I've got some of their plugins, and that was the first amp on the plugin. I think it was uh, yeah. who makes these plugins? Um, oh, it's some of the uh, neural stuff, neural yeah. DSP, yeah. and they have some of the Omega stuff on their plugins. Yeah. Um, and that was the plugin that I liked the most. So yeah, That's pretty cool. I, got, I I have that amp, and I've got the uh, the Obsidian. Right, and so the the uh, which one was that one where you first showed me? That is Grand the Granifier. Granifier yeah. and the Obsidian. They're uh, the Granifier is a one-channel beast. You know, just insanely awesome, awesome amp. You know. Yeah. I, you know when I my two favorite amps right now are in, in here are my MT100 and that amp. That's why if you look at my setup in this room, I've got all these amplifiers, but I've got my work desk here, and I've got those two amps left and right. Right. Of my work desk. That's but cool. Man. Funny thing is, is half the time I end up playing through this thing. Oh yeah, <laughs> I think I've seen that before. You've got those on your tour bus. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. The little okay, cute man. Yeah. Yeah. I used to have the one that's a little bit bigger than that. It was like a, I think it was a one twelve or something like that. Yeah. Um, that I used to have in one of my lesson rooms. I think I probably brought it out to hang with you a couple times. Yeah. Um, well, hopefully that cool. happens again soon, man. This is this yeah, dude is destroying our. Uh, Get together in jam sessions absolutely man it's been way too long i can't remember i think the last time i saw you was when dave reckoning got to open up for ultra bridge at yeah, man. blues i think maybe maybe yeah that seem about right yeah it's been a while man that's for yeah. sure well COVID has done some things for my guitar playing it's 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 equally hurt it as much as it's helped it you know it right. helped it earlier on because i'm like you know what all this downtime i'm gonna play the hell out of the guitar mm -hmm. and then my wife's preg was pregnant and um at all moving and all these other things going on and I would go a week and not pick up my guitar. I'm like, man, stop doing that. Stop yeah. doing that. And then it's easy got, to do. Oh, yeah. well, especially recently, you know, my, my daughter's three weeks old. So my guitar yeah. playing right now is in the gutter. I haven't, yeah. you know, any spare second I have, I'm, I'm holding my baby and, right. um, you know, like a good dad would do, put your guitar down for a little while. But a lot yeah. of times, you know, when you go through, um, a month or two of sparse guitar playing sometimes you come back more mature yeah and know? refreshed very refreshed you know yeah. find you know what i mean because then everything's like you know everything's new and seems new and cool and you got yeah. new ideas and you know it's it's good to take a break every now and then but, but that being said i'm at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to <laughs> my guitar playing right now oh well, you know what dude i've uh, you know Oh, it's, don't feel bad bro i've i've been you know i've been dealing with a hand injury um that's yeah. supposedly from the doctors that i've seen is not guitar related which if oh. anything good could come out of an injury injury it's not i don't have to worry about re-injuring it from playing more oh, um, but i a couple years ago it's been going on for quite a while um a matter of fact i taught at both petrucci camps the one oh. and two with this injury but yeah. I, I can play around it and hide it pretty easily um, yeah. As long as I don't have to play my own stuff, if I'm just teaching or whatever, you don't really. So what is the injury? Well, I just started noticing that my ring finger on my left hand wasn't working right, and that's the best way I can describe it. It's kind of like misfiring, like oh. it would land off or overshoot the string or undershoot or or something like that. And and the interesting thing is that I first started noticing it when I started teaching on uh, a six string uh telly style guitar and, mm -hmm. I, and I, i'm a 12 not 12 string but a six string acoustic tuned to standard tuning which i never play in standard yeah. so right out of the gate the string tensions are heavier they were feel heavier because it's yeah. in standard tuning so every time i get on my one of my seven strings it just felt like the strings were real loose and that's when i started noticing that i felt like my hand wasn't as accurate and and i finally pin you know established that it was this finger that was acting up specifically and um you know i just i didn't really know what was going on i just thought well maybe it's because i'm not practicing as much Ooh. and i started thinking about that going well if i'm not practicing as much wouldn't it be all of my fingers acting up not just one yeah. you know why would one finger just not be working right um and i, I was talking to my singer about it and, and my singer's uh, got a doctorate degree in sports medicine and kinesiology so he knows where he works um he knows the doctor that works with the houston symphony orchestra so Ooh. He talked to her and she let, she agreed to see me on her lunch break or something. So I just came down and she just assessed my hand and she did these strength tests where she would hold my hand like this and I would push out and I'd have my fingers out and I'd pull have to pull in right. And she did it on both hands and she was 
you know, within like five or 10 minutes, she was able to establish that my ring finger on my left hand, the muscle on this side only has been greatly depleted. And she said she didn't know why. She goes, she's, there's not a lot of studies on musicians' hands because they don't talk about it if there's something going on with their hands because they don't want anybody to know. You know, and she didn't know why it had happened. She said the only way that, that I could fix this was, had nothing to do with guitar playing. It was to, her suggestion was to buy a bunch of rubber bands and start doing exercises every day where I'm pulling pulling out. Because my strength going, yeah, look, Zach's got one. Um, see, I think oh, Zach's got one. Yeah. Right, so I bought some things like he's using. Um, or actually, I did it first with rubber bands. And and me, I'm dude, I'm stubborn. So I'm like, nah, man, screw this, dude. I can practice more and it's gonna come back. Yeah. You know, and it just, it really hasn't. I, if I sit down and I spend a long time warming up, which is the idea of warming up to me is like nails on the chalkboard. I've never had to warm up my entire life. I could just pick up the guitar and play. You know what I mean? So for me, warming up's a new thing. I don't, it's, it's hard to grasp. Well, man. if you're playing all the time, you don't need to, but. Right, yeah. and so, I mean, yeah, I've always played a lot, dude. So, yeah. and more in these last few years, I haven't played as much just for, because of how much my teaching schedule's increased and teaching at home. It's like when I get done teaching, it's like I gotta get out of this room. And then a lot of times I don't make it back in here to practice or something, you know what I mean? Yeah. So some of it could have to do do with that as well. And I'm not getting any younger, man, you know what I mean? I'm gonna be 53 this month, dude. So, you know, yeah. getting up there in the age, becoming an old fucking coot. Yeah. Uh, you know, so anyway, back to the hand thing. So, you know, I tried the rubber band thing for a little while and then you know, I didn't really follow through with it real well. And I went to Lee's, you know, you know, Lee Labrata. Yeah, yeah. I was at Lee's Christmas party. I think it was not last Christmas. Maybe, maybe it was last Christmas. No, no, it wasn't two, two Christmases ago. I was at his Christmas party and his drummer was there who, who is uh, also a doctor that works with Olympic athletes and uh, musicians and stuff like that. And Lee told him about my injury and he, came over and he instantly grabbed my arm and he started going like this up here in the muscle and he goes ah yeah there it is right up there you know he started doing like physical therapy right on my arm right there at, oh. at, at the Christmas party and and he, he said he goes you've got a buildup of toxicity in your hand or your arm which is causing the circulation of blood to it's, it's not flowing to and from your hand properly so I did like two two more days of or three more days of physical therapy with him before he went back home because he doesn't live here and by the t by the time the, the last session, after it was over, when I got up and I tried to move my ring and pinky finger, it was like, it's like, you ever got a cavity filled at the dentist and you leave and your face just feels like it's all like melty, you know, and like numb. That's how these fingers felt. And like for the next week or so, I couldn't, you know, pretty much for the last two weeks of December, I couldn't use these two fingers at all because it just, all the toxicity and stuff. And it was, it was really weird, you know, but I trusted the guy and I knew that, you know, I mean, you can't make somebody's fingers, you know, not work anymore just from rubbing on yeah. some muscle or something you know what i mean so i knew it would come back and I, I had to take the next week off from teaching and um and his you know his his therapy was he was, he was dude just go get some dirt out of your backyard put it in a bucket with some water and, and just stick your hand in there and practice expanding your fingers yeah. like this you know he said that'll build those muscles back up and and i thought it was kind of crazy sounding but i've talked to a couple of other people that said oh yeah yeah i've heard about that sort of you know thing you know doctors suggesting to do that um so i never did the mud thing yeah, again i'm not a very good patient um but i did order some of the things like zach's got on his hands so i've got these like um let's see I just had them out a minute ago they're not quite as intense as what zach has uh, oh sorry what I was saying is they're not quite as intense as what Zach has, but they're they're more like rubber bands. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, see that they're little. Yeah. You know, so it came with three of them, and uh, you it put them on your hand now. Yeah, cool. um, it's not any better, dude. I'm, I'm not very good at doing this stuff like this, man. I just want to play guitar. So yeah, I know, man. I'm mm -hmm. like the worst patient ever. I'd be. I was not a good student. I tried taking guitar lessons. That didn't work out. But uh, I took one. Yeah, I took one month from one guy, and after the month, he told my mom, I can't work with this kid anymore. You know, it's because I didn't want to learn Mel Bay book one and open chords. I'd come in every week and go, check out this Van Halen riff my friend showed me. Hey, I take lessons month, every, time I'm, every time I'm with another guitar player, I take guitar lessons. I just ask as many questions as I can. Yeah, hey, you know, every time you're around, every time you're around a show, I'm like, all right, dude, show me that. Let's go. Yeah, let's go, man. Yeah. I've got yeah. more from you, Shred, than any other player on earth. Awesome. Thank you, man. That's awesome. My, uh, yeah. My, my, uh, my main weapon is my legato is what I got from the legato workout. Yeah. 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 We were talking about that earlier. 
I was telling Zach that, you know, you've always been really great at supporting and, and you know, giving shout outs and stuff like that. And, you know, yeah. you know, I've always appreciated that a lot, man. Thank hey, you. Man, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to go and tell people where, where anything comes from. And yeah, that's, yeah. that's been, uh, when I remember you gave me the, um, the DVD ROMs, Mm -hmm. uh, intense pen, pentatonic yeah, uh, extreme pentatonics and extreme guitar, uh, guitar shred manifesto and yeah, the art of picking. Uh, yeah yeah and the art of picking yeah. Yeah. But i picked up i picked up a lot from those you know one one thing was uh i think it might have been the art of picking where you would uh you'd pick a pattern but you wouldn't play it to a metronome you just play it for a minute straight or two minutes mm -hmm. straight i can't remember right um just play it clean for a minute straight and i you know um, I apply that to a lot of what I do now, you know? Yeah. Um, but the legato workout thing, that was, uh, if I went from, from the first exercise to the last, which is crazy because it's one so day yeah, setting. Yeah. It would, it would take me an hour and 20 minutes maybe. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I got to a point where I would have to do that entire workout before I went on stage. Really? Every yeah, day. I never knew that well, you did the whole thing. Like yeah it's almost to me it was almost like yoga for the guitar like my hands felt stiff and then after i did a legato workout they felt free and open right and, so let me ask you when you do the legato workout how do you approach it how 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 long do you do um each shape do you do the whole neck up once and back or do you do it how do you how do you approach well, it i don't do it anymore because I, I tell you know i tell my students too when i when i do a guitar clinic or something i, I say here's here's this great great application that you can um go after on the guitar that's going to build your finger strength once you get that individual finger strength then you can put it to how you're really going to use it once you get right. to that level especially like the three note per string patterns right you know um once you get there you're going to be building that strength along the way anyway so you you, you can make it more musical all right but the legato workout's a great place to build finger strength and once you get that the, the world's your oyster kind of a thing Right. Um, so, so when you were doing it, how did you approach it? I would go um, up to the twelfth fret and back, okay. pretty much. Um, and then do it. Go to the next finger variation. Yeah. So I, you know, I would I, I didn't when I was just doing it off the top of my head. Yeah. I would do the one finger pattern. You know, I would do the. You can't really see, but the right. um, these fingers. Right. You know, and then I'd switch to these fingers. Then I'd switch to these fingers. And then I would switch to um, the whole steps with all the fingers and the. Right, two and four. And I, I'm not going to try and go fast. I'm just trying right. to do, trying to get the muscle flow in there. Right. The hardest one for me is this one. Yeah. That so sometimes, hurt. sometimes I would start up at the 12th fret and then go backwards and see how far I could go backwards with that. Sure. Um, that's a great way to approach it. Yeah. So, so I would do all the finger patterns with that. You know, this, even this one is easier for me than, than the, the middle, middle two. Yeah. But I would just take them really slow. Right. You know, it's not a race to get this. Right. One. And that was never the objective of the legato yeah. workout. It was never a speed thing. It was a strength stretching and accuracy thing. You know what yeah. I mean? That was the whole concept behind it. So I would uh, eat up every com combination off the top of my head. This, right. that, that. Whole step that, whole step that, whole step that, and then whole yep. step this way. Yep. There you go. Did you ever do between one and two a whole step? Oh, yeah, this, yep. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. That, that to me has always been a lot easier for me. I, I think the quickest I can play is between these two two fingers. Right. I would, I would be, I would be the same way because I always did my major scales or three number string scales that started with two whole steps like this, not like this. Yeah. You know because oh, it's. Okay. it's so you did the the um, Gilbert way? No, no, no. I do this one. Oh, okay. Yeah. You do that. Instead of that. Okay, yeah. Right. Because and the reason my thought process behind that is like this: it's like these two fingers together are longer than these two fingers, so it's yeah. going to be easier to stretch a whole step between these two than these two, right? Yeah, these, yeah. This, this two of them combined are longer, right? Well, I so that would always made sense to me. What's yeah. that? I learned it backwards when I was a kid. I was a big fan of um, Paul Gilbert, so I saw yeah. his fingering patterns and I fingered it like him. And then, you know what? I did that too. Yeah, and then I then I started noticing people doing it the other way, and I was like, "Let me try this." To me, one of the hardest things to do on the guitar is to relearn something that you've you've right. got muscle memory for. Mm -hmm. It's a thousand times harder than just learning it to begin with. I think. Yeah, I, I agree with that for sure because I was recently um, 
was reworking a Bach piece that I transcribed when I was in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. And I played it with that fingering that I transcribed it with years ago that way for forever, you know? Yeah. And I, I went back and started trying to relearn it and I was looking at the fingerings and I made a complete, two or three other arrangements of it because the fingerings that I came up with now make more mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. But I can still play it better the other way. Yeah. And I keep going back, it's like, well, you know, then in my head I'm fighting with it. It's like, well, maybe I should just, you know, you know, work it out because it's going to make more sense. I'll be able to play it faster and more easily yeah. with the new fingering. But it's so easy to go back to what your hand wants to do because it's done yeah. it for so long. You know, yeah. that, I, that it's been a real pain in the butt. And I've done that with like the Paganini's Fifth Caprice that I arranged when I was like right out of high school. And I've made like 20 different arrangements, it seems, of that thing. And I always yeah. go back to the first one. But the way I originally learned it is not the most efficient way to play it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's it's definitely harder than, than some of the arrangements that I came up with before now. But uh, you got to ask yourself, uh, you know, life is short. How many times, you know, is it worth dedicating the next month? Yeah, you know, for sure. And, you know, how, you know so, uh, something that difficult, it might take me three months to get that muscle memory. Yeah. Out. And, it, it, you know, that's like anything, man. It's like recording. When is, en when is enough mixing enough mixing? You know, yeah, you could mix yeah. forever, dude. Well, I think a big thing with the guitar for me personally, and probably, probably for you as well, and any guitar player is, uh, if you're going to dive into something and you're going to get dive deep, it's got to be something you love because you're, yeah. you know, if you really want to get it, uh, yeah. you better want it because, or you, you better really want to like it because you might have to spend, I tell, I tell people too in my clinics, you want, you see this technique, if you want it, it's going to take you probably nine months of doing it every day, yeah. you know? So you, you gotta, you gotta really want it to get there. Um, if it's not something that you're totally into, that's totally cool. So learn, you know, maybe go back to just learning um, a different technique or learn because anything you anything that's difficult, I think, technique wise on the guitar, it's going to take you a good me at least. I think I'm a slow learner sometimes. Sometimes it takes me nine months of yeah, just diving in and, and making sure every time I pick up a guitar, I'm actually putting a, an hour into it of that right, technique. for sure, man. I think that's uh, pretty close to being accurate with most people. Um, I really don't know, but I can tell you this. I remember when I first heard sweet picking, you know, was mm -hmm. when Ingve came out and nobody else was doing sweet picking when Ingve yeah. came out. And I remember hearing that and going, and I didn't know what it was. I didn't know it was arpeggios or nothing like that. And I just remember yeah. going, man, when I figure out what that is, I'm going to do that all day. Yes. And there used to be a magazine called Guitar for the Practicing Musician. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a transcription of one of Ingve's songs when he was with Alcatraz, Hiroshima Mon Amour. And in the beginning, in the intro to that song, there's a one octave B minor arpeggio. Mm -hmm. And when I, I was looking through it and I went, wow, there's that sound, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you got to remember, back when I started playing guitar, there was no internet and stuff like that. You know, you couldn't just hop online and see a million guitar players doing this stuff. There was nobody doing it. Yeah, but anyway, sure the was wrong. Yeah. And, you know, there was no tab stuff as well. I mean, that was the only tab at the time with that solo in it, you know, and that's was the tab correct. You, yeah, for that one lick it was. I don't know about uh, the rest of it because I, when I found that one lick, I didn't even look at the rest of it. <laughs> I wasted a lot of months on um, Trilogy Suite. There's a lot of bad tabs in general. It was, oh, my, I remember my favorite record growing up was Metallica Master of Puppets and I had bought yeah. the book and I played exactly what it said in the book and it sounded nothing like it and I thought yeah. I was just a terrible guitar player. You know, I, I encountered that as well because the tabs back then were, they're just awful. Yeah, and I'll okay. talk to people and go, well, I got the book. And it's like, dude, you don't want to, don't, don't, those books well, aren't right, man. Well, it's tough, you know, because you, you try to tell people, don't rely on tab, learn by ear. But when you're young and you're not experienced, it's hard to learn by ear. It is, man. Uh, it is. Matter of fact, I, I kind of gave up on learning by ear in, in the beginning because I would spend, you know, X amount of time trying to learn a riff by somebody and <clears throat> five or 10 minutes into it, I would have written my own riff yeah. trying to figure out their riffs. So that's when I figured out, well, I can kind of write. So instead of spending all this time trying to figure out all these songs note for note, which yeah. I'll never be able to use because it's somebody else's song, just go on the inspiration of whatever it is that I'm listening to and try to just be inspired and write in that style. Yeah. I mean, that's what I used to do when I was in high school. I would improvise along with Racer X records and I would never try to figure it out. I would just try to, I would listen to whatever Paul was doing and then I would try to mimic that without copying it, you know? So if yeah. he was doing an ascending run, I would do some kind of ascending run. If it was a descend, I would do that. Or if it's a sweep or a tap, I'd try to come up with my own thing that's fit in there in that, yeah. that realm 
so that anything I did come up with that I liked was mine, even though it might be heavily influenced by Paul Gilbert. Yeah. You know, and that's okay, you know, as long as you don't wear your influences completely on your sleeve, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you still have your own sound and style. Yeah. You know, I have no problem tipping my hat to my influences at all, you know what I mean? Because right. without those guys, I wouldn't be who I am, you know? Um, so that's that's when I you know just kind of figured out that well I you know I should just follow my own path and and just do my thing you know and and, yeah. and never, never looks back. My ear isn't as good as it probably should be because of it, but you know. Yeah. But how often do I have to figure out anybody else's stuff? You know, yeah. so. Well, some you know, people, uh, I think you have the bat camp like you you're saying where you um, you learn a lick and you put your own spin on it right off the bat. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that stuff's good for like, like what you're saying, like the more um, Paul Gilbert style playing or, or more advanced techniques stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. But I've heard the other side of the coin where say you're going to learn a Jeff Beck song or yeah. a BB King song. Right. Try to imitate that dead on, like exactly yeah. what they're doing just because yeah. you, you, I don't know, you can bring out their spirit you're playing, I guess they're their vibe. Sure. And, and, sure. and, and Jeff about, Beck, man, more about vibe than it is technique really. Yeah, Beck is amazing, dude. I, I, you know, I've, I've, I've always known that I was supposed to like Jeff Beck. Just, you know, that's good. Hearing guitar players talk, you know, I knew I had to like Jeff Beck, so I'd buy his albums and stuff. And I just never really got it at first, you know what I mean? And the album that, that really opened my eyes and ears to Jeff was that album he's got called You Had It Coming. Uh -huh. Have you ever heard that one? I'm not sure. Dude, that's a, if you haven't heard that album, you need to check it out because oh. it, it put Jeff Beck in a more modern sound for me because all of his old stuff you know it's yeah. it was, he was old when i was young you know what i mean yeah. um so it just it didn't have the modern sound and you know I, I just wasn't able to grasp it yeah um but this album it's got like modern guitar tone on it. it's modern it's it just sounds like our our time you know what i mean yeah. and and the songs that he wrote on that album uh i don't know for whatever reason they i just connected with it and it was just like it opened my ears up to all of his old stuff i was able to go back and go oh man i get it now but it had to be put in that in that sound for me to understand it and it's just like it's, I, it's like some of the most amazing stuff i've ever heard it's like yeah. i was talking to uh, a good buddy of mine carl from nile we had him on the show and he calls it Jeff Beck voodoo, you know, because yeah. it's like only Jeff Beck can do that and make it work and get away with it, you know, things yeah, like that. Yeah, he, uh, he's, a, he's kind of, for me, an intimidating guy to learn by ear because he's yeah. got so many really little... He's, have you well, heard the song he, he did called Nadia? No. Uh -huh, well, that's, I, might, that's, I, might, I might have, you know, just... It's, yeah, it's, it's interesting because when I first heard it, I didn't realize that he didn't write it, uh -huh. okay? And it's, uh, it was actually written by an Indian composer, and it's that what he plays on this song is actually the vocal melody the whole time. Yeah. Because when I was listening to this, I was trying to figure it out by ear. And usually, if, you know, man, if it's whammy bar stuff or something like that, I mean, there isn't anything I haven't heard or haven't done with a whammy bar yeah. until I heard Jeff Beck doing this. I could not figure it out. I mean, I just didn't know I was doing it. But yeah. it, what I initially, initially found out there was a combination of whammy bar and slide. Well, yeah. I wasn't able to get some of the emulations. But, but the most amazing thing about it or mind blowing part of it was that if you go listen to the Indian version of this, he's mimicking this woman's voice perfectly. Huh. I mean, it's spot on with all the quarter steps and you know the things that it, like an Indian music. Yeah, I'm definitely checking. Yeah, out. yeah. Look up his version of it, and then look look up the uh, the version, um, the original version. I can tell you who the original version is, like the composer, because I bought some of his albums after that. Uh, but when you hear it with this this woman singing it's just haunting you know and then he just nails it man it's incredible nice. yeah, I'm definitely looking that up. Um, have you heard him do um somewhere over the rainbow live no i haven't a great video of him it's during the day at a festival and he does somewhere over the rainbow and it's just that's cool I mean, man i'll tell you one of my favorite live footage is, is is when he comes out and joins uh stevie wonder live in madison square garden Oh, and they do a version of, of, of uh, Superstition because, you know, Stevie's starting the song, right? And he's like, I'd like to welcome to the stage Mr. Jeff Beck. And Jeff comes out and instantly starts getting into it, man. It's, it's rad, you know. Um, so, but speaking of ear training and all that stuff, Zach is really good at that stuff. It's awesome. It, it was. It's, it's kind of a blessing and a curse, I guess, you know, because then now you hear everything out of pitch if somebody doesn't hit a note like perfectly you're like oh my god it's gonna kill me i think <laughs> you know? yeah. that's the producer's curse yeah, yeah I, I feel that's kind of what i end up doing you know because when i teach people here you know they'll bend a note 
And they're like, you're almost there. You're like 90% of the way to that note. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, oh, it sounds right to me. And I was like, I can hear that wobble now. I can hear like when they haven't quite reached Mm -hmm. the pitch they should have. And it's, yeah, it's it's quite interesting actually. But if you ever wanted to really train your ear in that way, not necessarily learning how to tune a piano, but maybe like watch videos about piano tuners and how they approach each note and everything, it would really open up your... Your ears. So you're yeah. saying your dad would hear more than just like, you know, if you're t- tuning up and you hear that little wobble in there, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. So he hears yep. like three different things? Yeah. Well, no, what I mean is that he would hit three to four different notes together and he oh, would match every single one has a different, right. you know, when you're playing a triad or, you know, right. a bar chord, you can actually tune each sure. one of them a little bit better. And then he would do that on the piano. So pretty interesting, actually. Is that how you normally tune a piano three notes at a time or three strings at a time? Or is that um, the method your dad used? Well, so every note on a piano has three has three strings at least. Oh, I so, see. Right. So he had to you have to tune three strings to a unison tone and then that's one note. Right. And those so have to be perfect to each other. Acoustic, right? What's that? It's similar to like a twelve string stick, but three. Correct, yep. I got you, man. That's pretty it's pretty crazy. crazy. I mean, you gotta you have to really enjoy that process and and understand like i've helped him restring a piano and it's got i mean whatever 88 times three is it's yeah, about that many strings that you got to change and, so crazy. anyway uh, as far as perfect i don't think it's perfect pitch by any means because i don't know if that really exists i don't know if if i mean i think perfect relative pitch is a thing but i don't know I if think, perfect i pitch think is. perfect pitch does exist i think if it does i had a friend that had it um i mean we could be out on a you know on the weekend and go you know out and doing unproductive things like drinking and a lot and stuff like that and cool. we'd be a water burger at two in the morning and, and he could sit there and tell me what the hum off the ceiling fan was or if a mm-hmm. jet flew over he, he could go it's now it's five cents flat i could sit with him and turn my back to him and he'd have his back to me and i could put my four fingers down on random notes i mean it could be two hands and he could tell me what every note it was under each finger there's some random people with me, pitch. What's that? There's some random ass people with perfect pitch. Like Bill Murray, yeah. I think, has perfect pitch. And the some, actor? Yeah. That's what I heard. That's crazy. Yeah, I don't think you I don't think you, you necessarily even have to I mean, does he play? Uh he might. I think he plays piano, doesn't he? I think he might play something, but uh I think he played piano in Groundhog Day. Maybe, I yeah. Know. I didn't know if he was really playing that in the movie. But I don't know, I gotta Google that now. Um but yeah, that's I, I think you're just born with it if, if yeah. it does exist. But I mean, I mean and some yeah, people. I don't know if that's something Bill Murray sat and trained to do. I think you just. Right. I think you, you, you just have it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's C. You can hear yeah. that. Yeah. And then to be able to tell when it's like two cents sharp or two cents flat, you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know what two cents sharp sounds like. I'm probably glad I don't because I'd yeah. probably be annoyed. Well, I mean, if you, um, if you should test this kind of thing. Um, you know your songs by heart that you've recorded, right? Right. Sing one of them in your head and see how close that pitch is to the actual song on the record. Yeah, I'd be pretty bad at that. <laughs> that, might test, that might test your relative pitch skill. Yeah, you know? yeah for sure. I'm usually pretty good at that, actually. Yeah. Um, at just nailing the pitch. Yeah, but you got your pitch is better than most people, dude. Well, like, so like yesterday, I had a student who he wanted to learn, it was just like a country song. And, you know, I, I obviously knowing that it's country. It wasn't like, you know, millions of different. I mean, this is like new country, not like old, cool, like blues grass country stuff. And then so I would sit there and I'd be like, I was like, play a C. And then he plays that. And I was like, play G and then a D and then an E minor. And I just named all the chords to the song without having my guitar there. And it was right. So so we can play the game, right? We could say E. I'd say it's uh (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and and we'll see that's why i can't I, this guitar is tuned down half a step right now but i can't do it i can't be in half a step down it's not because i don't like it i prefer down half a step because the strings feel better but it messes up my mind of where i'm at if that makes sense i've, I've noticed that with people that have really good pitch they don't like to play in like jar zombeck yeah he plays in standard huh yeah he, he yeah and with learning the guitar and playing guitar B, if all you did was play standard tuning, yeah. <laughs> for me it would be a world of difference. Yeah. I'm all, my guitars are all tuned different, so I never know. Yeah, I and, just and, from, twice and, half. and and even though I play in half step down most of the time, even if I'm in standard, because I have to teach in standard for with some students, 
I don't, my ear, I don't hear, you know, it's just, you know, I don't think about it like that. You know, it's like for me, no matter what tuning I'm in, this is E or this is A, you know, and I don't think about it as anything else because, you know, because then you get into, yes, I hear you, Zach. <laughs> and it's like, to me, that feels wrong in my throat. Does that make sense? Like where it's at? I'm like, that's totally not an A, dude. What you just No, No, what is your dad playing? Uh, well, he plays in an Aussie tribute, so he's usually no, no, no. tuning I mean, down half he, a step. Oh, so he he does play half step down and doesn't. Bother usually, him. does he? Does he? You ever heard him complain about it? Yes. Yeah. Like I, he when it's his guitars, they're standard, but because he's in the Aussie thing, he tunes down half a step right. because whatever. But uh, no, it, yeah. Here's a good exercise. Like so, like do you? So Rusty said that you were taking vocal lessons and stuff, like for your, like well, where you can you, start singing you and stuff. Your solo stuff. Sometimes, you know, I, I took a couple online. Um, I think between albums, I took three online lessons. Um, you know, I but I, I sang more than I've ever sang in my life in between these records because this project I'm working on, uh, this vocal project, I sing. I take my son to soccer practice pretty much four nights a week and sometimes they're three hour sessions. Mm -hmm. So I'll sit in the car and I'll sing for three hours straight. Um, and Do you get people walking by looking at you funny. You know what? I don't care. <laughs> I know, I'll, man. <laughs> I'll look at them in the eye and sing full voice. There you go. <laughs> but I, uh, I've gotten to the point where I will, um, first I'll, I'll listen to the song, write down the lyrics of the song. And I'm trying to imitate it as well as I can for phrasing and, and the way the vowels are pronounced and all this thing. So I'll, I'll write down the words, then I'll move the words to, to how they're phrased. Mm -hmm. So if they're on the one, I'll start right on the one, but I'll move them however that singer phrases them. And then I will write down the word um, instead of um, instead of how it's spelt, I'll spell it how they sound, how they're sounding it out. Okay when I'm practicing singing it. And then I'll listen to uh, where they're putting vibrato and I'll put a little squiggly line, almost like a guitar vibrato over where they put that in that word and where they don't. And that helps me kind of sit there. Um, and I've got, I've got this book here. I don't want to give it away. I don't want to give sure. my project away, but yeah, uh, no problem. But um, you see, I've got these pages and pages and pages of these things that I've done with this, I'm trying to be very organized, but it's uh, it's a passion of mine. And I also have read a bunch of books and a lot of history on artists and the way, the way um, they vocalize and everything. And I think no matter what you can, just like with guitar, you can read a thousand books, but you're not going to learn a portion, you know, a fraction as much as with that guitar in your hand, playing along, doing it. Is, is the same way you know right so, so real quick, oh, i'm sorry zach you, you well i was going to talk about this quick exercise that you could try okay. you yeah. know for your vocals and stuff so my theory has always been whether it's super fast or super slow or whatever vibrato and all that good stuff if you can sing it you can play it on the guitar right if you even can't if you, it, you can't play it yeah or vice versa right, right. like now the only the, what i used to do was i would hit I would try to find like where does my vocal cord start on the lowest end and where does it end on the guitar in the highest part. So I learn songs on my when I drive and when I'm running around. I learn guitar parts and solos while I'm not playing guitar and then I know exactly where they need to be based on my vocal cords. Does that make sense? It's an interesting perspective for sure. Yeah, right. So like the lowest note I could hit before I started doing uh, the testosterone replacement therapy was a low F which a normal F this it's F sharp on this, but I'm down half a step. So F. so it'd be like, mm, I could feel where that is in my throat. And then, so I would do scales that low to kind of understand where I would feel all of those notes. So if I heard a riff, I can tell if a song's in half a step down or drop or D standard or drop C sharp, just because I can't hit those notes anymore. Right. Then I would go as high as I could until my voice ran out so and that used to be at a high e, uh, actually a high f as well so i had like an f to an f so that'd be two octaves no three octaves. Uh, three octave one yeah. well one two three four oh. kind of i could the bottom end of one and the top so, end of another okay. so and then i would sing everything i could on the guitar there and try to match it to where i felt it in my throat if that makes sense and then so then i could literally just sing something and I could go do do do, 
and I knew exactly where I needed to be on the guitar. Now it's down half a step, so every time I do that, I'm I'm always messed up by one fret. It's the weirdest thing. But whenever I tune my guitars, like I'll change strings and I'll do stuff, I can get it to where it's within two cents of being perfect in tune without having to grab my tuner. Yeah. So, and that's just from me knowing where it's at here. Then I got on the testosterone, it dropped my voice a little bit. So then it turned to an E, a low E note to a high E. So I dropped down half a step. So that would be a great exercise for you to try to just sit there and hum as low as you can go. I don't know how low your voice goes. Rusty's goes a little bit lower than mine. Just naturally, I think, but yeah. maybe maybe it's an E flat because you tune your guitar to E flat. Maybe you know it'd be interesting because I've never really I've never really tested any of that stuff. And I mean, Mark, as much as it's you fun. sing, you know, you probably know where your voice fits in the range of the instrument and and the multiple tunings that you use. Yeah, you know, I I tend to have to tune down to like B tunings if I want to sing full voice on a lot of right. stuff. So to get your full range, you to do a B standard or something. Yeah, sometimes B flat. But um, what's the lowest note you can hit with your voice? You know, when we're, just, when we're talking about, uh, I, I, I can hit an E, you know. Mm. Uh, right. That's an F. No, I can go down low. Oh. So that's an E, yep. Yeah. Am I oh. happy? And it doesn't have to be a great, you know, a solid note just to know where you, you know, you stop. Yeah, there's... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think and this this record I just um, I'm, I'm recording and getting, getting ready to release. I I try to hit some of my lower ranges more. I used to be afraid of, to do that. Um, I feel like when you're singing high, when you're, you're singing up there, you mask your voice and you kind of get away from who you are, and it kind of it's almost like a safety blanket to sound like somebody else when you're singing. And when you're singing lower, it sounds more like the way you speak, and it's more um, right. You know, it's more out there, but it's. Uh, I figured on this record I would do more of that. Speak, you know, sing in a lower key. Right. My producer Elvis. Um, you know, whenever there was a part where I'm like, you know, we, I got to figure out the tuning of this song because this is too low. He's like, you know what? That's where your voice sounds the best. That's where I love it. And after a few records of doing that, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go for it. I'm just going to sing low. So there's a lot of stuff on this record where I'm. And the singer I've been practicing for the last year and a half sings right. and, um, yeah. back when I used to start singing I used to sing away from the mic because I was nervous you know right. it's one of those things when I was when I was younger I was terrified to be on stage terrible yeah. stage fright and then one night I bet my band a hundred bucks that if I didn't um, go you know as wild as any of they they did at the show I'd pay them a hundred bucks a piece <laughs> so the very first song I jump up on the drum riser and jump off the drum riser and I'm banging my head. I'm doing it ever since that night. I felt comfortable on stage. That's cool, man. So I did the same thing with the singing. I'm like, you know what? Don't be timid of the microphone. Don't sing away from the microphone all the time. You know, if maybe if you're having to scream and note and you don't want it to be too loud, right. but I sing right up in the microphone. I'm like, this is my voice. If you don't like it, you don't like it. You're going to leave, but this is my voice. Yeah. I'm going to live with it. I'm going to sing to my full, I'm going to sing as good as I can. Yeah. Right the mic. I'm not going to hide anything and uh, be yeah. deliberate. I think just that's that's very cool, yeah. being deliberate. Yes, um, right. You can tell what's interesting about the vocal part is they can tell when you're being shy with your voice. Yeah, you can kind of hide it on the guitar, you know. Sometimes so you can, but with your voice, you sound really like this. And yeah. even when you're singing, you could hit the right note, but it doesn't have that push, that power. Right. You know what I mean? So you have to just belt it and not care. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a big thing for me is just try to concentrate on either whether it's guitar playing or singing is being deliberate. I want to see you. I want to hear you sing, man. Like that. Yeah. Now. Like, it, I'm pretty excited about that. It's it's yeah. funny to use the word deliberate because that's how I, I, I that's the word I use to tell students um, how to play certain things. It's like you know I'll have a student or whatever and they'll be playing it and I was like you know it's like no but play it very deliberate. Play it like you mean it. You know what I mean? Put some stank on it. Are you are you renting that note or are you owning it? You know what I mean? Are you buying oh. or renting? You know. <laughs> I like that. Um, yeah, so it's like, and then practicing very deliberate. I've, I've read some studies on practicing, and there's the there's the there's a um, a study on it called um, something about deliberate practice. That's the title of it. I can't remember exactly, but um, you know, and that's the way you should do everything. You can tell when a guitar player is uh, going into something, you know, not fully committed. You know what I mean? It's just like you know, I mean, I can tell you how every note in the chromatic scale will work over every chord in less than five minutes. But if you don't commit to it and really go for it, it's not going to sound right. And it's yeah. just like you can play all the notes over the right notes in key, and some of them don't sound good. 
if you, unless you go for it. You know what I mean? You gotta you gotta commit to it. And if you yeah. if you make a mistake, just do it twice. Just do it and again. Even in little yeah. patterns, like if you're picking a pattern where you've got to jump back up to a higher string, and you're treating the last note you hit before that jump like it's a little hiccup instead of hitting it. That's me. I do that all the time. Where I'm like, why am I not playing this smooth? Because you're thinking about the note, the next note, instead of the note you're about to play. Right. I do yeah. that constantly. I've got to constantly, if I'm playing something that doesn't feel right, I'll try to analyze it as much as I can. And then I'll, a lot of times it's because I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about something three notes ahead instead of the right. actual note I'm playing. Right. Time. Yeah, I can see that, man. I want to see this, this five pattern that you were talking about earlier, if we could. That pattern is... Uh, <laughs> Can you, yeah, there we go. That's just the Paul Gilbert, you know. So you're just going up. Um, that kind nice. Of, um, right. And then you can, you know, or you can climb, climb up one pattern. Or, or playing it slow like that. Just going up so and you're down doing the three, four, four. like right, there, like that. Was that what yeah. you just did? Yeah. And then, uh, going down yeah. the you know, going down the E and B string. But every time you hit a new pattern, you're starting with. So I'm going down, up, down. You know what I'm saying? Um, so every time you start that pattern of five, you're having to hit a different upstroke or downstroke. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm, um, you know, Russ, you say you don't need to warm up. I do need to warm no, up. No, I do now. That's what I'm saying. I used to not have to warm up, but now I do. So it's like it's a new it's concept for me. It's just a kind of pattern where if I don't warm up, if I sit down first thing with it, it's not going to be flying until I'm, I've been playing for about 20 minutes. But um, once you get it, it's it just feels so good, man. It just flies. It's like yeah. the fastest picking I could ever do. Other than, other than picking on a single string, you know, doing like your Ingve, you know, right? Single string runs. That yeah. kind of stuff, I can play as fast as I'd ever need to. But as far as like changing like strings, strings man. playing those patterns of five, you can just blaze through them. I mean, it's. Uh, um, but that being said, it's not a it's not a pattern yet that I can just pick up the guitar cold and just go through it. Right. I've got to I've got to put a metronome on, play for a good fifteen twenty minutes before I got that. On, on board sure man yeah it's just for me it's it's frustrating now because you know i mean it's not to say that i never had to warm up like i could just pick up my guitar and play my hardest song or anything yeah. like that you know instrumental or whatever i don't mean it like that i mean just like i could just pick up the guitar and pretty much play you know what i mean um without having to really warm up i think i would just pick up my guitar and i would start my warm-up was i guess just all my go-to licks that were easy for me that was kind yeah. of my warm-up you know what i mean yeah. and now i find that i can't even really do that you know it's it's been a real setback so i don't know man i think you just need to try to be more consistent i think my i'm getting add the older i get yeah <laughs> and i just get distracted by every little thing and and you know and then i end up doing something else instead of what i'm supposed to be doing and stuff like that but um well, if i knew if i knew you were going to have guitars in this interview i would have improvised for a while and gotten all juiced up and ready to play. <laughs> right up man you're right on man but i say for, for uh for my warm-ups I think I always, I always improvise two or three songs. That to me is by far the best format. Yeah, I, I think I need to start trying to employ some of those tactics for myself to to just approach warming up differently than I have been. Because to me, warm up always seems like I'm supposed to be playing exercises to get my hands ready to prepared to play whatever it is I'm going to play or yeah. practice. You know, maybe that's the wrong approach. Um, I like to play songs, man. Like you know, pick something yeah. that that is, you know, like yesterday my warm up was Paul Gilbert's Curse of Castle Dragon. Yeah. It's just fun. It's just fun to play, you know, and then it's got the cool, you know, you know you're just doing all it's like you're adding exercises in yeah, already, right. you know, and he's even got the that stuff. Yeah. And it's really cool. And then he's got that, you know, the big the diminished pattern. Diminished if you don't know that song, that does not look like a warm up. That looks like I'm just shredding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what Zach's warming up on these days. Yeah. So. Or arpeggios from hell from Ingve. Yeah. But see, then that would mean I'd have to actually sit down and learn something by someone else. Well, I'm just saying in general, like you could play some of your stuff that isn't yeah. super, super difficult. Maybe it's one song yeah. that you're like, or, or like, you know what you were doing earlier, just improvising over that, 
backing track, that's fun. You know, yeah, it, yeah. to me, to me, that's my tried and true. If I need to get warmed up, if I got a show in 20 minutes and I've been doing interviews and I need to get in show shape, first thing I'll do is put on a backing track and just, um, yeah. you know, I, I tell people too, with, with the, in the clinics, like when you start on improvising, don't try to go killing it. Um, yeah act like sometimes put on like a nice smooth jazz backing track and play like grandma's in the room, you know, yeah. hit some pretty notes, grab some vibrato yeah. and just sit, sit on it and be able to, you know, be able to do the, um, you know, do da, 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 ba, da, ba, da, da, ba, da, you know, and sing what you're yeah. playing like George Benson would. Yeah, dude. I love George Benson. Yeah. So, you know, you're, so you're being deliberate what you're playing, you know, what you're playing, your head and your fingers are doing exactly the same thing instead of a reflex, just, yeah. I like like that phrase to do it like grandma's in the room. What did you say? Exactly. Play play the guitar like your grandmother or your mother's in the room. That's a good way to describe something nice. You know, grandma doesn't want you to just go. She doesn't want you just burning. Um, My grandma does. (laughs) 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 My grandma's cool. My My grandma's usually our, uh, our, at our shows, she's our our merch lady. Oh, that's great! You're she's right. always selling our merch for us, dude. Yeah. Warm warm like, is that your grandma? I'm like, hell yeah! That's gonna dude, be your grandma's hot. Warm yeah. up like grandma's in the room, and we'll <laughs> not even. Yeah. That's funny, you know. That reminds me of um, when I was getting ready to do the last Petrucci camp. Um, they asked me to submit the titles for my classes, right? Yeah. So I made up all these different titles and there was, <laughs> I used to watch SpongeBob with my kids and there was a SpongeBob episode called Grandma's Kisses. <laughs> so that was gonna be the title of one of my classes and I submitted all these bullshit names, you know what I mean, just for fun, yeah. just to see what kind of response I was gonna get because all the teachers were on the same email, you know, so I was like, seeing the other teachers' class titles. So I just went for it and I just put up all these Grandma's Kisses and all this other shit. And <laughs> they were like, oh, you're funny, dude, very funny. Yeah, I like that. Grandma's yeah. Kisses is a Yeah, we're going to be teaching about Grandma's Kisses today. Um, you know, in that, if we go back to that five pattern thing, yeah. one thing you can maybe try uh, to think about it, maybe in a riff writing situation too, you oh, know, yeah. like you're still keeping, say, a 4-4 four, four beat, but, uh, you know, say like um, you're doing like, I have a song where I do five and then on the one, I'm always hitting this. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Mm-hmm. And it's still in four. So it's can't really hear you very well dude oh shoot sorry is that better yeah so you know yeah. and then if you change down up down up down up down up down up yeah. down up down up down up down up down up and then um i don't, I don't know I, I think that that might instead of keeping it in a soloing situation you can push it into more rhythms yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think about that too as well with alternate, you know, with groupings like fives and sevens and things like that. You know, you can, one of Day of Reckoning's songs starts off with um, a six that's a, a pattern that, that I first learned from Ingve. It was like, you know, you know, something like that. Right. I've so, that pattern a billion times. That's one of my right. favorite things. Yeah. yeah. So, there's like a couple of variations you can do on it. You can do, or you can do, so you got the first one would just be the regular Ingve one. No way, what was it? Right, and then you can do one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So that's just descend, ascend, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Right. That one trips me out, but the, the other ones. Right, and then the other one is uh, one, two, so it's three open, one, two, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, so. Yeah, the two kind of go hand in hand. It's that third, the two kind of go hand in hand with the up. But the third right. one is the ascend, descend one trips me out. I'd have to Yeah, get. so what I'll do is I'll take in, and I'll take and I'll, I'll put all those three and I'll just put them on, on random. Yeah. And I'll yeah. just, so you know. Yeah. Just like struck running through them and and just try to you know come up with different things or add other th- runs into it or stuff like that you know. Yeah. But you can do the same thing with sevens or fives or or anything like that from a riff standpoint too. But I wanted to ask you you know we're going back to that fives thing again. So you you initially told we're saying that one of the notes was an economy pick. Where's that economy pick at? So if you're doing the Eric Johnson style stuff, he'll go. Yeah. <laughs> So is 
it the is it the last two notes that's the same pick direction? I'll go down, up, down, up, down, down. So just do one group of five. So one, the first group of five would be down, up, down, up, up. So you go down, up, down, up, down, down. Oh, yeah. Down, up, down, up, down, down. So when you're going between here and here? Oh, it's when you're going from the first five to the second five. From the G to the, from the, G to the B, yeah. I see, okay. So down, up, down, up, down. Wait a minute. That's an up, right? Down, up, down, up. Down, up, down, down. Oh, it's a down, down, down. Yeah. I see. Well, that's weird for me, man. Yeah. I practice, I always practice that thing straight alternate picking, man. Yeah, he, you know, and the way he starts it, he'll do stuff like. Right. Or. Um, yeah. I love it, but it's something that I can't. Um, I can't dig into it for some reason. You know, I like to, when I play, I like to, especially when I'm on stage, I get my adrenaline going. I want to dig in. And those right. things, those um, um, economy pick things kind of get destroyed live. You know, they just, for me. Yeah. So I was, uh, you know, when I was really heavily into Sean Lane, when I first discovered Sean and really started trying to absorb everything he was doing, I had his both of his REH instructional videos and um, he was showing all of those pet pentatonic licks that he does. And, yeah. um, you know, I was messing around with that stuff. And I and I came up with one of my own that's um, that uses economy picking. It's a four and a five. It's like. Yeah. So you go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. So it'd be up, down, down, up, up, down, down, up, down. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. And so you just, you kind of do the economy pick on the string change. Up, down, down, up, up, down, down, up, down. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. So it's up, down, down, up, up, down, down. Are you down, also up, picking everything or are you doing economy pick? You're no, doing it's the economy pick is on every string change. So it's up, down, down, up, up. So that would be one, two, three, four. And that fifth note's actually one to start over again. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. So up, down, down, up, up, down, down, up, down. Right, so anytime you tra change strings, it's always an economy pick. And then yeah. what you do when you get to the fifth string, you just start the pattern over again. So you got, you got. Yeah. Right, so you just start over once you finish the, f the, yeah. the five. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. And yeah. then you start over on 12 on the fifth string. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. You just do that pattern of four, five on every group of two strings. Yeah, okay. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. And then you can take that across multiple positions. Yeah. I, I feel like your your guitar playing, you're just dying to alternate pick the shit out of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like when you get going fast, there's yeah. I, I could I don't think I could I mean I don't want to say I don't think I could ever, but but I, it's, it makes it a lot easier, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and I, even though I'm not a big economy picker and don't really use it that much, um, I use it more in sweeping where I might do like a, a, a sweep across uh, three strings and then change positions. Maybe I'm doing like a D minor 11 and go. Yeah. You know. So this would be up, down, down, up, or sorry, up, down, 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 up, down, 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 yeah. down, up. So on the D string, you got three notes. So that'll be alternate picks. A lot of guitar players, when I'm, show them this they'll want to do a slide there and it's not a slide it's a pick so up down 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 up down 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 up pull off up 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 down up 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 so there, everything's picked on the ascend yeah. you only pull off one to the 12 on the first string when you descend everything else is picked so so you got this shape here it's like a d minor seven then you go to here and do you got this yeah. major seven shape in the middle of this d minor you know so so you get one you hit this note on 12 with the up and it's down across four strings and then up on 15. that's probably the most i use economy picking right there where you do yeah. the three the three picked notes on the d string yeah it could be a train wreck man yeah <laughs> one thing i like to do uh like if you've got you know just your regular three note per like that and then you move up to the next position and yeah. then the next one what i'll do is i'll throw in a seven pattern by adding in the chromatic tone that doesn't match diatonically so 
Ooh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You now what was that? What are you doing, dude? I was like thinking about some other lick in my head. <laughs> so you repeat that pattern over and over. Yeah. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then, and then I'll go to the one that's maybe a five fret stretch, right? And then I'll go. And then. But you have to turn your pick around on that one, like a five pattern. Yeah. yeah. Any odd note you would have to. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then you kind of move that back. I love it. So are you just keeping that on one string? Just for this particular one. Uh, I love like it. That. I love it. That's definitely going to be. Uh, I think if you practice those, you know, those normal five patterns, the picking will feel very similar to that without having to change strings. I kind of took it from uh, Sinister Gates a little bit because he had a song, uh, the solo for Backcountry, where he followed the outline of this B flat major, C major, and then D minor, like that. But he just stayed on one string and hit all the chromatic tones inside of this box. And then he moved up, and then he moved up, and then he had to do this stretch where he, you're kind of missing a fret here. So. Something like that, but then I was like, "Well, I don't want to do it in eight. I'll just do it in seven. Uh, something like that." That's generally, you know, I generally think about chromaticism that way. I'll take, uh, you know, when you're playing in a mode, like say we have a, a mix Liddy, and you do something like, you know, just. like that you know it's just the same shape every octave so it's whole steps and then you move up to a and do whole steps and you move up to a and do all whole steps so so when i'm thinking about chromatically you either have two choices when you're doing all whole steps you can do this right so five six seven nine or you do five uh seven eight nine so is that right yeah five five six seven nine or five seven eight nine so exactly you do one one of those two patterns because you've got you know you're, you only have four fingers so unless you tap you're you gotta pick so you can come up with like like all right so it's like a, so i'll do one two three four You know, something like that's kind of, you know, it sounds very jazzy kind of to me, you know, maybe like a bebop lick or something, but that's an interesting way to do it. So that lick you're talking about, Zach, you would, so if you were going to change strings with that, you'd go like, well, what was it? Yeah, I have to think about that one. It's a little weird, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my fingers don't want to do that naturally. That's interesting. Yeah, so. What happened to my shit? Oh. Uh, something like that. Right. That's really cool. Good. I think there's like a, one of the solos off my instrumental album. This stuff gets me excited. Yeah. Uh, that just makes me want to play the original lick. Just to get yeah. it out of my system. Right, there you go. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, that chromatic lick is cool, though. That's uh, or the chromatic note. Um. So if you were doing, um, if you were doing going down, say, D mixolydian on that, you would go... that right yeah i think so yeah I think and, and, and putting this into an actual music situation could i mean it's possible but i choose to just use it as an exercise for now and then if something happens um so like when we were talking about jamming over backing tracks and stuff you know that's like my favorite thing to do just to like get warmed up, but then also create something. So I had this thing, I was jamming over a C sharp 
uh, C sharp minor. And for some reason I did like a sweep or it might've been F sharp minor. I can't remember, but I was doing like a sweep and then I tapped and then I slid. And then for whatever reason, my hand stayed here. And then I ended up tap, like I ended up holding a note. And then, so I was pulling off to this note. And then I was like, something like that. Right. I don't know if you could even hear that at all. Yeah, you could hear it. So then I was like, I don't know if I'll ever use that in a song, but then that Bumblefoot thing came out and I just did like this. Uh, something like that. And I was like, oh, well, there you go. So improvising over backing tracks, you might only find like one little nugget of something that would actually work somewhere else, but it's worth holding on to, I think. Yeah, for sure, man. Well, I've never seen that lick, so it works. Yeah. It's mine. What, what are you What are you doing with that lick again? Just so, um, so instead of like, if you got like your, oop, you're just following that, right? A major, and then instead of, it, it's almost like you're going. Uh, something like that. Right. You're skipping a tone. So, so I'm trying to get it in the light. Let's see, what's what's your middle? What's your finger on your on your right hand doing? I'm holding down the fret. Uh, so here I'm going, and I'm holding the twelfth fret of the E, and mm -hmm. I'm pulling off to it. Okay. And then I go back to ten. So how are you sounding the note on the B string? I'm not on the B string. You're not on the B string. You're all, everything is on the same string. I'm pulling off oh, to see. the twelfth fret. It, the way the lighting is, it looks like your right hand's on a different string. I was going, well, how's that note sounding? Oh yeah, no. I mean, yeah. it's as if I'm doing that. Oh, I see. But I'm, you know, so but I'm holding. You're just like moving. And then I I follow back twelve, ten, nine, right. eight, five, or seven, five. So. So you're skipping up a, a, a third every time with your left right hand. Correct. Yep. Because one Correct. of my friends was like, well, why don't you just play the freaking scale? And I was right. like, because I'm not playing the scale, I'm skipping a note, you know? So it'd be like, you'd have to go like. That's probably the way I would have played it. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is, this looks cool. <laughs> it's like you're shooting the bird, man. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. To all the yeah. haters, bro. <laughs> all the angst. Yeah. Uh, then the only other thing that I could think of would be cool would be like if you did I kind of took this from rusty that pentatonic from this low seventh string and fives maybe. Yeah, that's kind of cool Yeah, those that's fives that's like the from the under the influence like kind of yeah, I like it right it hurts yeah there's there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with intervallic sweeping in in that stuff you know, like... yeah, that's just like it that's a straight up pentatonic thing but it doesn't really sound like it a conventional pentatonic right. yeah I don't know, man. No, um, I'm sharing audio. I can just play one of the solos with those fives patterns on there. Oh, cool, man. Yeah. Um, I can just play it, play it with uh, through my stereo and have the microphone pick it up here. Mm -hmm. All right. So this solo starts out with like the vocal melody of the, the chorus and then goes into a pattern of fives descending. Is that clear? Yeah. Yep. Sounds good. That's a dude. sick rhythm too that you go in at the end too, man. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, yeah dude, that's, that's cool, I, man. I really enjoyed the um, the call and response of that whole solo. 
It um, wasn't just, you know, random notes or anything like you had like the call and then you responded to it and you had like three or four different versions of that, which I really like. So, you know, all the solos that I, uh, I put together, I just play a thousand times. I don't, it's not, you know, I can't improvise like that. I would never be able to improvise that. So I got to sit down and I got to write it and write it and write it. And Me write too. It. Rusty it. doesn't do that. Yeah. I, I have to sit and kind of think, think them through and I enjoy that. But he says that, uh, what do you do? You just kind of, I've just, I, you know, I've just spent so much time practicing improvising that a lot of times if I, and, and this comes from my old band. That makes when sense. I was, when I was in Outworld, you know, I'm such a technique freak that if I write a solo, it's going to be way more technique driven than if I improvise it. So the guys in Outworld were always like, you know, dude, we like your improvising better. You know, I'd go in and I'd have a solo written. Like I, when we did the original demo of City of the Dead for Outworld, I, I, I wasn't even living in Houston then. I was living in Atlanta. And that's when we first met when I was living in Atlanta. Um, I flew back to Texas to do this the solo and the rhythm guitar tracks for the song. And I had a solo written and planned. And when I got there in the studio, it just wasn't working. So I just, they were like, well, just go for it. See what you can come up with. And so I nailed it. And it was, it was so good that on the album, it's not even half as good as the demo. And there was no way to save what we did on the demo to use for the album. So I had to I had to change some of it and try to rewrite it. But it was at that moment, you know, that they were like, well, dude, why don't you just try improvising more of your stuff? You know what I mean? See what you can come up with. Because if I sit down and write it, man, I was still in that mode for my instrumental album going into Outworld. So it was really just, you know, over the top. And uh, if I, I feel when I improvise, there's more laying, not, I guess laying back could be a word to use for it, but it's just got more phrasing involved. And Do you think I, it's just more organic? I think so. It's because if I sit down to write things, then I'm going to try. It's just my natural instinct to try to jam every note in there. I can, you know, I can't mm. help it. It's like when I get behind the wheel, I'm driving fast. I'm walking I fast. Think you can come up with math, <laughs> magic when you're improvising that you can't do when you're just sitting there writing. But when you're writing, you're improvising at the same time and just kind of capturing those right. improvised moments and saying, all right, that happened when I improvise. Let me make sure that happens every time. Now. Right. So, so now I find like, like I'm working on this piece of music um, and it's like, I ha I need to write for this thing. Okay. So I find that I, it's harder for me to, to settle and you can go, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I, you know, I'll find a lot of ideas that I like, but I can't go back and f I don't feel like I'm, I'm having a hard time finalizing something and stick going, okay, this is going to be it. You know what I mean? You know, how do, how do you get there? You know what I mean? That's where I feel like I'm at now. I can't, it's harder for me to write a solo now than it is to improvise one, oh. you know, but this piece calls for something written. It, it can't be improvised because it's got to have a d definite theme to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it's kicking my butt right now. You know, whenever I do that, Which one? I, the one I was playing for you earlier. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. You know, if you just, for, for me, if you just keep on playing that loop of that solo section, with whatever you've written, there's going to be certain parts that don't feel as good as the rest, you know, and you just, without even like stopping the, re stopping the playback, just keep playing it through and then fumble your way through that part in different ways. And then all of a sudden you land on something, even if it takes you a hundred times, then it, I think once it feels good under your fingers and feels fun to play and, and emotionally. It's so I have a question about that then. So when you're writing, let's say it's 30 seconds, right? And, and in your head, you, do you like listen to it before you pick up a guitar or do you like to just sit and have like a fresh, like you sit with it on only on guitar? I will. Uh, well, if it's something I've, I've written, you know, if I've, if I got a song written and I know it's a, uh, I know the chord progression, I know the song like the back of my hand already. Um, I'll first I'll just, allow myself to just kind of experiment and throw my fingers at the guitar in weird ways that don't seem typical. Like I'm not just going to play a pentatonic riff over it. Um, I'll do that for a little while. I'll try to make stuff as unique as possible. Then if I keep on failing, I'll, I'll say, all right, let me take the vocal melody and I'll mess mm -hmm. around with the vocal melody and morph that in, in as many ways as I can. I'll look at the chord changes. If there's some weird, um, chord change that really sticks out. I'll definitely hit that chord change in the middle of the, in the middle of the solo. Um, and then, so let's say you write, like, you, you know, you've improvised and improvised uh, like 20, 30 times and mm -hmm. you have just like one little nugget that you really like just yeah. in the middle there, like a couple phrases. Do yeah. you then try to build at the end of it and then how to lead up to it? So you like leave it in there and then bounce yeah. off of that. Yeah. A lot of times if I, if I know it, um, 
Well, I find sometimes if I do that and I have a little part that I love and I'm trying to improvise, sometimes I'm improvising down at the end of the neck and I got to get back to it or whatnot. It kind of screws up your improvisation. So I'll just, I'll improvise without keeping that in mind, but I'll know I have that in my back pocket to plug in to that spot at the end of right. the writing of the solo, but I won't let it handcuff me where I'm going to, where I'm going to mess up every time I improvise a song because I have to hit that, that part. Okay. Um, you said something sweet. about that. It was really interesting. Um, about you go back to the vocal melody to, to writing, help you write the solo, right? Yeah. So, um, I recently encountered that I was, I was doing two guest solos, uh, for an acoustic album. My friend Carl Sanders is doing, so it's my acoustic guitar debut, right? So my singer, Brad, um, he's a guitar player also. And, uh, he was re doing the recording for me of the acoustic sessions. And, um, the stuff I was playing over just wasn't, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, I wasn't able to just lock on and just play like I normally do. So I was kind of struggling with it. And, um, Brad was like, look, sometimes when you can't hear the melody or, or can't find what seems to be right, the key center, or, you know, he goes, he goes, for me, I will, I will find a melody and, and write a melody. And, and, he, and what I ended up doing was, and I know I'm not doing a very good job explaining this, but um, so he had me build a melody that would work over this chord progression that I had to solo over. So I, I found a melody that worked and then I harmonized the melody and then I came back and soloed more over the melody then I was actually underneath the, the rhythm guitar part. And that kind of worked for me in that situation because then I, what I was, wasn't hearing, you know, it brought it out and highlighted it so I could then have a palette to build upon, I, I guess. I don't know if that's the right way to describe it, but you know, he said that as a singer, he will find a melody for the solo section based on the vocal line or create one and then solo to that and then bring the harmony to it. And I think Pierce said something like that too. I was about to bring that up. Yeah. Here. We had Pierre Nelson on the show from Scar Symmetry, and he said it, he does something similar to you. To he that. puts a synth. Exactly? He puts a synth track down of whatever they send him, and he creates his own melody behind it that doesn't exist. And then he will solo over that, and then send them the patch. Yeah, it's freaking yeah, genius. I, I do a lot of guest solo work, and there's been. It's it, the interesting thing about it is is that a lot of times when I think when I think it's when it sounds like it'd be easy to play over, it's not. And when it sounds hard to play over, and sometimes it's it's easier. But uh, you know, sometimes I'll get this stuff sent to me that's just so busy. There's like no, where am I supposed to play at? You know what I mean? Um, one of the instances was um, Rings of Saturn. They sent me a tune to play on, and there was just so much going on. I just couldn't do nothing but play fast over it. You know, it's like there was no, not even really room to vibrato or nothing. You're bend a note, you know. And I I was so uncomfortable with it that I said, Look, man, I don't really think this is very good, man. I'll send you guys your money back and whatever. And and they were like, No, dude, send it over. Let's hear it. You know, I was like, All right, dude. And and they loved it. And I said, All right, we'll fix this one note, put some delay or something on it, and then we're cool. <laughs> you know. Um, another instance was uh, with the Sean Baker Orchestra. They sent me this track, and it like again, it was very busy. I said, Man, can you can you send me a mix that has nothing but rhythm guitar bass? and drums on it and when they sent that back to me i was able to play over it easy but i think if, if i hear too many things it gets distracting you know what i mean um too many parts and it's it just gets confusing so if you just give me drums bass rhythm guitar it's much more i feel like there's much more room to say something or be expressive because despite what everybody thinks i don't like to play fast all the time <laughs> you know what i mean um you know but it just has to be the right environment i think i naturally set myself up to play fast by the stuff that i write um but sometimes you know through improvisation i, I have more space or depending on who's sending me material like this thing that i'm working on now I can let you hear some of the backing track to it that I have to play over, but you'll hear pretty quickly. It's not like something you normally hear me play over, I don't think. Um, here's a little, I think if you should be able to hear this some other system. Can you guys hear that? Okay, check it out a little bit. Here's some of it. That's just one of the sections, like another part is, um, let me see if this will take us up there. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, this is definitely more open. You know, this 
track has got a lot of emotion and a lot of depth to it. So I'm not just, I can't just go in and wank over it. You know what I mean? It's got to be, I feel like I've got to compose something to it to yeah, do it justice. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so that's, that's my struggle of the day. <laughs> you know? That's a big struggle though. Yeah. So I'm really focusing on it and then just trying to, I've got to commit myself to some lines and, um, do the same so Gilmore can, thing. Like we're saying, where you just sing into a microphone, what you would do on your guitar and your, your voice. Right. That's a good idea. I'm, at, you know, I'm always open to suggestions. It's, it's, I've really learned a lot. Um, just doing the, the few episodes on the show that we've done just by talking to different people like yourself, some of the ideas that you had in Pierre Nelson. And even when I recorded with my singer, those guest solos for Carl's CD, you know, the suggestions that he had, I guess it's a lot of times this kind of stuff doesn't come up in conversation, how everybody approaches it. You know what I mean? So I think there's a lot of value in that that we can all learn from and share. It's pretty cool, man. I think, it's I think you're being, I think you're being modest. I think you've learned a lot from me. Let's oh just, yeah. Let's just tell the truth. Yeah, yeah. Here, all right. Steve. Okay. You're right. No, I'm just kidding. Thanks, Zach. You know, yeah, I think everybody <laughs> does it, even if they have a style that they do it in, they do it different each time, regardless. Yeah. You know, it's, it depends on the mood, the day, the actual struggle with that song. You know, it's, it's, it's I think it's this yeah. constant struggle of figuring out how to, how to tackle that certain, I mean, I've had solos that driven me nuts, taken me yeah. two weeks to put together because of yeah. the, the tempo's too damn slow. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's not, you know, so, sometimes it's just in a perfect BPMs where it's just your yeah. fast stuff is too fast and your slow stuff is too slow and then oh, yeah. it feels good. Yeah. And yeah then you, know, still, exactly. you know, I'll, sometimes when I approach like a more of a aggressive solo, I'll go into my pocket and pull out all the technical things I've been working on. Which one of these fit this tempo? All right. Now I know I actually have a, climax lick that i can pop in after i've figured out the rest of it but sometimes there's songs that just don't have any the tempo just doesn't have anything you've been working on for the past two years that that, that will work yeah. out. Gotta go That's down the hole again dude i i've got a i got a question for you man or a, or a request okay yeah. you remember a while back i was i called you or texted you during a lesson uh, and i was asking you about um what is it uh it's one of my favorite songs by you guys alter bridge um uh, this one starts off dun 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 yeah. I can't see what you're doing. Are you playing? Where are you playing that? Much like a minor. We're not a minor, but right. Well, my last notice. So even, but even with the opening riff, the first of the da 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 da, are you hitting a power chord in with that? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's there's that classic Tremonti picking. Yeah, dude. You got a sick right hand, man. Oh, All those thrash okay. rhythms and shit. That's yeah. sick, man. I think that yeah, there was some that right hand kind of it, it it helps and hurts me at the same time though, because I've when I was a kid, all I did was but if you apply that to the higher strings and try to do solos, you pick way too hard. And I've tried to, yeah. over the years, I've had to relearn a lot of stuff. Yeah. The, the, the dynamic of that, you know, you got to pull it back a little bit, but I mean, yeah. still, you know, like with all the Paul Gilbert style picking, he's a very heavy, aggressive picker, yeah. you know what yeah. I mean? And I love that man. Yeah. You know, that's why I alternate pick, you know, I, I mean, I think when I first started playing guitar, I naturally economy picked just i don't know why right. just i mean being self-taught you know yeah. as educated I, you don't know you don't really know if you don't know you don't know what you're doing is wrong or right yeah. um and then somebody showed me three note per string scales and said no you got to alternate pick it like this and i think that's where i started alternate picking but for me it's like with economy picking it's hard for me to get that attack yep now zach uses a lot of economy picking and, oh, and it sounds yeah. great but for me i i changing strings with when i'm trying to play aggressively i can't make economy picking sound aggressive that's, yeah, why, I mean, that's so. why when I stumbled upon those patterns of five where you can pick them instead of economy pick them, I jumped all over. Yeah. Because I want every, you know, there's certain things that turn my ear when a guitar player plays. 
whenever I'd hear guys do patterns of five, I'd always go, Oh shit. What's that? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. that's always been the thing. I'm like, that's badass. Oh shit. That's killer. Yeah. That's always what puts it over the top for me. So I'm like, you know what? I got to get that. Yeah. Um, and I went down the rabbit hole with Eric Johnson. I learned so many of his licks. I spent hours, I'd spend all day just learning an Eric Johnson passage. Yeah. And I would, by the end of the day, I'd, I'd sound pretty decent at it, but then I'd pick up the guitar a week later and it would be, I'd have to spend hours getting there again. It yeah. was never something that I, like you said, you could really, that I could dig into heavily and really just own, own it. Like I could, yeah. I could some other stuff. So right. when I found the other pattern of five where you could pick every note and just focus on, you know, focus yeah. on those exaggerated ups and downs from the beginnings of those patterns. I was in, I was in heaven. I'm like, I got it. This is, this is my, this is my path. man, yeah, we've got man. so many yeah. records now with all the different bands. Yeah, dude. For me to, yeah. How do you keep up with all the stuff, man? I, when I go on tour, we get a, you know, we put together a set list and practice for a week beforehand. Right. Um, the toughest thing was doing the uh, Royal Albert Hall show where we played with the symphony and we, we played a lot of songs that we hadn't ever played before and had to that weren't really that fit the symphony better right. than the rest of the songs. But a lot of these songs were like more of the six minute songs and the, the more epic kind of stuff. And yeah, that was some really cool footage, by the way, too. I got to see some of that. Oh, thanks, man. That was, yeah, that man, was, that was really my cool. favorite night on favorite nights on stage. Really? We were that, a lot that would of songs. Be cool. You know, imagine the uh, imagine the pressure of that show where you got cameras everywhere and then uh the symphony and you're playing songs you're not comfortable with because you, you haven't yeah. played them but we're playing them because and then those guys are back there reading charts perfect oh yeah they're killing it you know what i mean the that's that's night, that's a lot of pressure we did it two nights the first night i had him I, I i couldn't really hear him too much the second night i had him blaring through the side fills and it was i mean it's, it was ridiculous up there so did you find that you played better with them more blaring than not i well I feel like I play better when I'm not worried as much. So the first night, first half of the first set, we were very nervous because we knew it was, this was going to be logged forever. So you're trying yeah. to, you know, usually I'll get around the stage and, and make a fool of myself rocking out. But that night yeah. I'm in the moment, I'm just staring at my guitar, making sure everything's played right. Um, right. And then they had this 45 minute break where you play for 45 minutes, then you have a half hour break and come back. So I wasn't mm -hmm. used to that, but after that break is when we all loosened up. We're like, listen, we, right. we, we played well this first half of the show. Let's, uh, let's just have fun with this. You only get to do this. You know, this is the only time in our yeah. lives we got to do this. So have fun with it. And from that point on, it was, uh, especially the second night when we knew we had one night recorded and, and um, nobody made any big mistakes. We had to yeah. just enjoy the second night. Yeah. Just that's pretty cool. So down on stage helps you play so much better. You know? Yeah. So what was the process of doing that? Um, did you did you actually work with the the orchestra to get them the music or how did they f who who directed them and what to play and they um they took our songs and then they put them into a computer program where they had synthetic instruments playing all the instruments and they they arranged our songs like big band um and uh turned them into us i think the first one we heard was cry of achilles and we heard it mm -hmm. and like, that sounds killer i love it yeah. yeah so you just they just took your music and put it into a program and then they so they generated their but it, the, the song wasn't changed it was exactly the way yeah, you guys played exactly it. the way we, well exactly the way we played on record and that was one thing right. that we had to figure out is when we were we were practicing you know we a couple of things would happen we're like wait a minute something's wrong here oh shit we've been playing this live different than the record for eight years we got to go <laughs> listen to the record and we learned it the way we played it yeah um, so there was a few times where the hardest thing, everybody has to start on the one. And when you're playing with the symphony, they don't, they're not improvising. If there's, if they fall right. off one note, it's, it's a train wreck. So everybody's yeah. got to start on the same note and know where that, that perfect spot sure. is. And if there's a pause in the song or there's a bridge section that goes on forever, we had to pre-plan all that. You can't just, Hey, in the bridge, feel me out, bro. I'll, I'm just going to come in here. You can't do yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's specific because they're playing by the charts, man. Oh yeah. So we, we got into a room, a rehearsal room in London and, uh, you know, as we walk in, we hear them practicing our songs and that was pretty sick. And, um, yeah. so when we finally go down, we figured we're going to have two days straight of rehearsing this stuff. We'll be fine. We only got through each song once pretty much because yeah. half the day went by and we, 
you know, there were so many, hey, hey, guy, do this, do that, with 40 different people in there trying to coordinate right. things. Yeah. Uh, we got through each song once before we had to record the DVD. So that was a little. So what was sound check like for that gig? Um, gosh, we just played a few songs, you know, two or three songs. So it wasn't really any different with the orchestra there? We, they just played along with us, you know, once we, no, you know, actually we played, we just played a lot more than we normally would. We, we might yeah. play eight songs or something for sound check. Okay. Um, That's like a performance in itself. Yeah. Yeah. So you it know was, what I mean? it was amazing that, that, that venue itself. Was so, fun. so they kind of probably already had some sort of sound check done with the, the orchestra by, yeah. before you guys got yeah. there. Yeah. So you didn't have to sound check, sound check with them where you're waiting for you everybody know, to get stage is ready for the band. We'd come out, okay. already, their instruments are already level checked and, um, right. you know, and they won't have each instrument on a microphone. They'll have maybe four violins on sharing a mic or something. Is, is it because they're that loud or what? No, I think that's just how that, how they do that. I don't think every single instrument in a symphony is okay. So uh, they got like overheads and things like that. Catching, yeah, yeah. capturing. I think, I think a mic will maybe catch a couple or two or three. Right. Um, okay. I see. Time. Yeah. I never really thought about that. You know, how a live yeah. orchestra gets recorded, you know, it's, I imagine it would be probably the same process if they were recording them f for an album. I, you, know, you know, I could be, I could be wrong, but I, I thought, I don't think each of them had a mic. Right. But, uh, yeah. it was, it's pretty incredible experience and uh, we wanted to do it again, but then you know, the world came to a halt and yeah, who knows when we'll get to do that again. Yeah. Well, that'd be cool, man. That'd be nice to, to have that opportunity. So that's pretty sick, dude. Yeah. It's probably a pretty proud moment, right? Yeah. That's, that's awesome. My favorite night on stage. Yep. Well, very cool, dude. Um, anything, you know, before we wrap it up, is there anything you'd want to promote or say? Uh, I mean, I kind of think we already did maybe, but yeah, no, I just have the solo record coming out sometime around October. Um, that's about it yeah, musically. You know, I got a bunch of other stuff going on, but I, mean, I want to do that, that album for, for charity coming up. Right. Um, but uh, that's just a fun passion project. Some Sure, man. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be, I can't, I can't wait, man. That's all right, dude. It's, it's going to be cool, man. I can't wait to hear it. Awesome, brother. Well, dude, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day, man. Um, I appreciate it very much. And we'll, uh, we'll let you know when the show is going to go live so you can promote it on your socials and whatnot. And Absolutely. have a great day, brother. It's always a pleasure, man. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, brother. Bye.